OK, so welcome to this session. I will be talking about how you can use satellite I IoT to track wildlife and monitor remote equipment. Plenty of you know me. Um, it's great to see so many faces actually in chat, but hopefully there are some new faces as well today. Um, and you can get a sense of how you can use this exciting technology in your work and in your projects. And the disclaimer, which is the exciting uh, thing I want to share with Steph, which is really funny considering Ellie's internet was so terrible. This is being streamed to you via a Starlink satellite internet dish in my garden. So all those problems that Ellie has on a wide connection, I've never done this before. It would be completely unheard of to do anything like this from a satellite connection back in the past. Um, but I'm trying this, I've, I've been testing this unit. Um, this presentation is going through sp satellites right now to you. If it fails, like I lose connection for a split second, I'll jump back on, but just a disclaimer. Um, and hopefully after this, we can actually tweet that we did this via a satellite internet connection. Talking about satellite IoT. So, who am I and who is Arabada? So, Arabada is a company or the organization that I founded that develops open source hardware primarily. And we work with a number of conservation organizations across the globe now. And one of our kind of um, fortes or niche spaces is satellite I IoT development. So it's a great space for me today to talk to you about that world. What is satellite IoT? Well, obviously it's internet of things. And satellite IoT is the use of primarily small sats. It's not always small sats, but it's the use of satellites to communicate to usually a number of devices. So not just one uh, device on the ground, but many hundreds or many thousands of connected things across the planet. And on your screen right here is a new nano satellite from an Australian satellite startup uh, fleet. And it's the beginning of a very exciting space, um, space race, because it's not just fleets that are trying to get constellations up to achieve this ubiquitous IoT to space connection. Another exciting startup is Kines. You have 25 satellites launching in quarter two, 2023. And that is all about connecting devices of any size, of any shape um, on an animal or a piece of equipment so you can get data back from them. So what's it used for? Well, primarily it's tracking of wildlife. Uh, you would have heard of probably Iridium, which is one of the big um, long-term satellite companies that have been tracking everything from sharks to sea turtles uh, for many years. You would have heard about Argos, that again is heavy in the marine space because it's such a good technology to use in that environment. But of course, you can also track and monitor remote equipment. So I've been using satellite IoT in Antarctica. You can see a time-lapse camera on the screen there and a large number of king penguins that it was watching. We can get battery life from that camera. We can see how many photos it's taken and we can use it effectively to let us know to go and maintain that device. And of course, you can use it to recover equipment as well. Often, it isn't just about getting data back from your tracked object. It's about where is my tracked object? So if you had a pop off uh, archival tag on an angel shark and it popped off to the surface, you will use the satellite network to find out where your device is, because it could be anywhere. Um, and that's often a quite a, a valuable thing to do as well. And of course, tracking assets. And when we mention assets, it's everything. Everything from cows to plastic bottles. And later on, I'm gonna do a kind of live demo we're going to look at a dashboard of some plastic bottles floating in the, the ocean and we'll have a look together to see how you can also use this technology. So what is satellite IoT? It isn't big data. A lot of people get confused when they get in this space thinking they can send a photograph over a nano satellite or a video or big chunks of data from these devices. It's the opposite of that. You're talking about 32 bytes. So that's enough for some GPS data, um, some battery life, and maybe some configuration files when a satellite passes over. Of course, you can send lots of packets of small data, but it's still that premise that satellite IoT is about lots of small connected devices and not about big data. And of course, one size doesn't fit all. You may want to send data from a camera trap in Antarctica where you can put big solar panels on there and batteries, 
but you can't do the same when you're trying to track a tarantula and send data from the uh, back of a tarantula to a satellite, then you're restricted in size. So you have to think about the limitations, batteries, size, and also longevity. How are you going to keep that device working? So low power is really important. And importantly, the transmitter is only half the puzzle. Once you've got the electronics, the actual real difficult part is the encapsulation of those electronics to keep them safe, or antenna design, or the type of battery. Do you go for a primary cell, which can't be recharged, but lasts a lot longer? Or do you go for a rechargeable one, hoping you're gonna get that device back? Building the actual physical tag is half the puzzle because you'll find there's constraints and challenges in that, let alone just getting the equipment. But I'm here to help. You can always ask me and I'll show you some of the devices we've built uh, later on in the presentation. And airtime and cost differs across the networks. And we'll have a look at that in our case study when we look at how we could connect an audio moth to uh, an IoT network. Um, and it's important to take into consideration that world as well. So looking at the audio moth, you all probably have heard of it. It's a very ubiquitous, very well-known audio recorder. How are you gonna connect this little device from the middle of nowhere? So I picked a Tokotumit, which is a one of the most remote settlements on the planet, population 345 people. How would you get your little audio moth to ping you and say what its battery status is, um, but it's still working, which is very important to know, is my device still pinging is just as vital of, is, is it actually taking data? You want to know that it's powered up and you want to know, is it worth traveling to these remote locations to get your data and your devices back? And also, how much is it going to cost? Is it going to cost me an arm and a leg for one device? What if I want to put 50 devices out there? So what are these options available to us? Well, there are lots and lots and lots. And I'm sure a lot of you on the call too are interested in which of these, and this is a small selection, there are many others, which of these do you pick? And that's a difficult choice because where's the data, you know, where's the knowledge about should I go for a LoRaWAN lacuna to space solution? Or should I go for an Iridium so I can send a bit more data than the other networks? Or should I go for something new and evolving such as Swarm? Um, I'll try and answer a few of those questions and later on we can chat too. But the answer is they all have a unique use and you have to have a look at that and weigh up the pluses and the minuses as to what's going to work for you. So very quickly, if I want to go for an Argos solution, then I'm looking for something small, like a small device, which is low powered, that I may want to use in a marine environment because it's excellent in that space. If I wanted to send a lot more data, I'd probably pick Iridium. So then I've got the option of always having connectivity because they have global continuous coverage. So I can just turn my device on and talk, whereas the other ones need satellites to pass over. I may have a LoRa device. I may want to use LoRa uh, locally, which is uh, a long distance radio, or I may want to use LoRa WAN to space, which Lacuna Space has opened up, which is an exciting UK startup. So that may too be interesting. Or Hyber, which is a new startup from the Netherlands that are going for low cost. Uh, Fleet, which is a kind of hybrid of LoRaWAN hubs that then send to their network. Or Swarm, which is a very low cost new constellation um, that has good developer support. So what would I pick? Well, if we were to throw three examples up to connect an audio moth, I'd first start looking at probably the Swarm evaluation kit. So it's a £350, $500 kit. And as you can see, you get the full tripod, you get the power with a solar panel. It's big. So, I mean, you, if you want to hide that on a tree and, and, you know, make sure no one sees your audio moth, it's an innovation. But it's an option for me. I may want to go for a rock block, which is right in the middle there, which is Iridium. So that's a kind of install in a little waterproof case um, modem that you can communicate to quite easily. You can see the row of breakout pins there. And you can send it data such as battery life or maybe the size sort of space left on an SD card. Or you may want to go for an out-of-the-box solution, which is Arabada's own um, tag, which we call Horizon. And that will give you GPS so you know where your device is. It will send data from connected devices and it's an off-the-shelf you can buy it, it comes in a box. I mean, I have the box here. Uh, you open it up, you plug it in and it works. And we'll play one of those later as well. So you've got choices to make, but you also need to look at what else is in the box. What's it gonna cost you? So Swarm solution is very cheap, $60 a year for 150 kilobytes of data a month. And that's enough to easily send a ping every day with the status of your device. And that's very cheap. 
and they're new to the market so they they're emerging but they're, they've given these evaluation kits out in the minute to see what you can do with cheap satellite iot data rock block that's been around for a long time very stable 12 pounds per month line rental 14p for a message so you can take these stats away tot it up in a little calculator and think okay how often do i want to transmit how much is it going to cost me a month and come up with that data or if you want all you can eat uh, transmit um, continuously to every satellite you could go for a 63 euro package inclusive line rental with argos and then you can just transmit to every available satellite and use that as your solution so weighing up those costs are going to come down to budgets how much data you want to transmit and they're variables that you have to figure out yourself as to what you need from this project and it'll come down to the data the amount of data how often you want to get that data back to you and this is really exciting akib is actually on the call so you can chat to him in chat this popped up in my twitter yesterday and this is a new uh, wilduino argos board and akiba has linked LoRaWAN or laura so you've got that ability to connect lots of de devices terrestrially like 15 20 kilometers away to a board which has an argos chip integrated and he took the argos uh, horizon developer board schematics which are open source took them and built something beautiful with it so we can chat to him later about what this would look like or how many he's going to make and how much it's going to cost but this is an exciting board um, you could use this to have multiple audio moths talking to this one uh, hub and transmit using that so you can see how you're starting to figure out how do i combine data and cost and connected devices into something a little bit more connected or you could go for fleet portal this is an off-the-shelf a solution it has LoRaWAN, iridium orbcom and it talks to their nano satellite constellation as well so there are options out there but importantly how do i connect my audio off to these cool little iot devices well it's a lot harder just taking an audio off off the shelf because you'd have to work yeah. around that but with an audio off dev which is the one available from the group gets recently this breaks out the connectivity so now it's a lot easier to use an audio off dev device to connect to third party bespoke devices like our iot selection here um, and i recommend for any of you out there thinking about your audio off projects look at the audio off dev board it has the functionality and breakout to make it easier for you to work with um, and there's a lot of partners on wild labs that would be very happy to look at connecting it to one of the new swarm connected devices um a horizon kit a rock block etc and you'll be able to use that to get data from your audio off and transmit it and we'll have a look at some of that later on in the presentation as well so example two how would you track a sea turtle well this one is a sea turtle from the island of poilau that i was very lucky to track a few years back and when it comes to sea turtles and it comes to any marine mammal it's all about that split second window on the surface when your animal comes up to breathe. You can see here there's a very beautiful sea turtle that has provided a perfect demonstration of this. Attached to the carapace using an epoxy paste, so that's actually called magic metal, this grey substance on here. Um, there'll be a, a small fiberglass matting that's been epoxied on underneath that. You apply this matting, you then attach this fiberglass um, shell to the outside of the tag to keep it in place and you use this magic metal to then harden and keep that tag on and when you get that tag back you can actually just get a little knife and cut under it and the whole thing peels off and it's like nothing's ever been there so it's a nice attachment method but um the tag itself this is an argos tag uh, you can see by that whip antenna out the top when this turtle comes up to breathe you have a short space of time to a detect you're out of the water b send that transmission to the satellites you can't transmit underwater to satellites and you have to do this with minimal battery power to save that battery do it quickly and effectively and then when that turtle submerges put everything back to a deep sleep mode so if you're thinking about projects that you want to get involved in where you're building your own tags you're going to want to pick a solution that is fit for that purpose and obviously you can't take a swarm evaluation kit and glue it to the shell of the turtle it's not going to go well for both the turtle or your project but you can take smaller tags like horizon or some of those smaller iridium breakouts 
Or there's another great one that Sparkfun have released, which is a breakout board for Argos, again, based on the reference board of the Arabada design. That's a little kind of uh, breakout you can put your own GPS on. So this, this wasn't around a few years ago. You couldn't just get an off the shelf satellite transmitter with everything baked in. You had to do it all yourself. But now over the last few years, because we've been working as a community to try and get this tech out there, you've got things like uh, Akiba's uh, boards popping up now as well. We're starting to get good at, at cracking this as a team to say, let's make some satellite technology that we can use to develop our own tags. And um, with the Horizon board, you can get those fast transmissions. You can get the battery life you need because it has a deep sleep of just a few microamps. You can connect GPS that has it built in, pressure accelerometer, et cetera. And you can make small compact devices. Um, importantly to detecting on your, on, when you're on the surface with saltwater switches, we did a project recently, a few weeks back with a team from Oxford um, in Cape Verde. And we found that even in, in that space, no matter what your hardware is capable of from a satellite or GPS perspective, the basics of just getting good detection is still paramount. And we're still working on that as well. Um, because everything we do is open source. We'll share our insights into good saltwater switches versus saltwater switches that aren't as good. Um, and other devices like pressure sensors and accelerometers. And that's why we can move forwards together. If we keep sharing our insights into how we build these devices, we're going to get more from it. So moving on, how do you track plastic waste? Well, this is a question posed by National Geographic that I worked on as a project. And we tracked plastic bottles through the Ganges River. Um, this is what the bottle looked like. We had the device up at the top. We had our battery array at the bottom, and that gave us the ability for the bottle to, to self um, write. So when it capsized, the, um, the actual gravity effect of having your center of gravity at the bottom with that heavier weight of batteries meant the bottle would pop back. And what I want to do is instead of chirping on in a presentation uh, that we all see every day is I'm going to show you the project, the live project, not the National Geographic one that finished, but one we launched from the G7 event in Cornwall in June. We're going to actually log into some of the dashboards and we're going to look at some live tracked bottles and just give you a real sense of how you actually do this. So not just slides, actual dashboards and screens and we'll connect some devices. So to do that, I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to reshare um, a different window to show you what this looks like. So give me one second whilst I do this. Uh, da, da, da. OK, you should be seeing um, a Firefox window. I can't actually see chat, but if anyone wants yeah. to nod, if you're not seeing it, you can see it. That, you look good. Brilliant. OK, you are looking at tracked plastic bottles. This is one of the bottles on my video here. We CNC milled a cavity so it fits a 500 milliliter water bottle it has the argos antenna on the top it's just like that cad designer showed a moment ago electronics so the the actual horizon board with gps is in the top here the satellite modem sits right under the antenna and then we uh, we actually put in an array of just double a energizer lithium batteries six of them here and we encapsulate them in so they're completely protective and water ingress and we launched these in june so this is, you can see if I zoom in here, this is the area down in Cornwall when we had, where the G7 event was. We named all the bottles after the countries of the leaders that attended. So USA, Canada, UK, Germany. And we tracked these bottles using the exact same open source hardware you can get today and go and use it in your own projects. And you can see that a lot of the bottles from the north traveled and then beached pretty quickly. So Canada traveled up north and then ended up on a beach here. It was found by a litter picking team. The next day, they, they actually found it and sent us a photo saying, we found your bottle. And we could see from the live data that it was definitely Canada because it was pinging us from the beach. Germany up here, Germany had an interesting story. It actually beached here, was found by a member of the public. You put it in the back of their car, drove around on holiday for two weeks. We could see it going off to, to holiday caravan sites. And before they left, I don't know who these people are, maybe they're watching, but before they left, they drove back to the beach and they chucked it back in the sea, which was which was fantastic. So Germany 
went on a land journey, went back in the ocean, and then for a while was floating and then finally beached up near Bude. But great data for us to see what was going on. However, they went on a, they went on a journey. So they, they've been tracked since June, we're now early September. We followed them all the way through the English Channel. France ended up beaching in Guernsey, was picked up by a litter picking team and has been posted back to us to be redeployed. Italy ended up on a beautiful beach in France, has been found and is currently in someone's house. Uh, I can't really probably disclose it, but someone's house over here. <laughs> I know where it is, but I can't share. Uh, and Japan is still live. So let's log in and have a look at Japan and show you what the dashboard looks like. So if I go to my Argos portal, I won't share the password because we're live on the interwebs. I'm logged in to my Argos dashboard. So this is where I see all my data. We are going to go and have a look at the bottle data. So I click on view data and go to my program ID, which is up here, click search. I can see my bottles. So you can actually see here that the bottles that are pinging me today. So here's the 9th of September. Bottle five is Japan. So bottle five connected to the MB satellite at 1036 today, ping me its location. Bottle seven, bottle one, six, four, et cetera, all did the same. And I can track my bottles in this dashboard. I get the long and latitude of them. I can scroll across and get other data such as battery life and so on as well. And I use this to export this data. In fact, we log into an API and we show it live on the web, uh, on the website, on the map that you just saw. And it's exactly the same for you. When you get like a, an IoT Horizon board, you will see that it's decoding here Horizon Short. So it's, it knows it's a Horizon board. And you use this dashboard to very easily export your data. So you can put it into your own charting maps, see where all of your devices are. You can query them as well. So you can kind of say, show me only bottle four over this period of time. Or you can go into the mapping system up here, look at when the next satellite is going to pass. So the predictions, so you know when you're going to hear from your device or go and have a look at other data such as mapping and see where it is in another map um, and get better data there like speed and so on as well that you can pull out of it. But it's, um, it's a really nice, simple way of working with your devices. And what I'm going to show you now actually is we are going to actually take an actual uh, Horizon device. So this is the kit, you can see it flashing there. And this is the exact same hardware with the antenna there as well that goes in the bottle. So I'm going to plug it into my computer and I'm going to share the screen uh, over terminal and I'm going to show you what it's like actually communicating to one of these little devices. So once again, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to reshare a different screen. So let's first see if we can find the screen. OK, can you see my full screen here? Do you want to give me a nod, Steph? Yeah, you're good. Is it supposed okay. to be a uh, black like yeah. control panel? Black control panel. So if any of you are on the call and you're not um, techie at all and it scares you, it shouldn't scare you. It's a, it's a lovely screen called a terminal that you can use to talk to lots of cool devices. And I'm just going to plug it in now. I'm plugged into a Raspberry Pi, by the way. You can see it's Raspberry Pi. So here's my device. I plugged it into three normal AA batteries. I'm going to connect it with uh, the cable, USB cable. You can see it's lit up now, right? So I've got my little LEDs on the top. Now it's connected, I can talk to it. So if you were wanting to track your own plastic bottles, you could get the open source design of this and send it to any 3D CAD CNCing company and say, make me some. They'll send it you back in the post. Here's your 10 shells. You then get your hardware and you plug it into your Raspberry Pi. And you can talk to this device and you can query it and you can get data from it. So I'm going to type in a command here. Um, I'm going to say status. And this is going to come back, hopefully, because we're live on the internet. And it will tell me the status of this device. And it takes it a little while because it has to check for all of the connected modules. Here's it going to do it. Yeah, there we go. OK, <laughs> finally did it. So it comes back and says, OK, I'm connected. I've got a GPS module detected. Yes, I haven't got a cellular because you can put a cellular modem on this as well. Don't have a SIM card and I do have a satellite module. Great. So what are we going to do with it? Well, we want to program it and tell it I want you to wake up every X minutes and get a GPS fix. And I want you to transmit every 
Y minutes to one of the satellites. So to do that, we are going to basically get the config file off it. So I can type in these basic commands like read config and do test one dot JSON. Hit enter and it's read the config file. And now I can open the config file and I can have a look inside and inspect it. And this is what it looks like in the config. It's in a format called JSON that a few of you may be familiar with, but it's super, super easy to use because you can literally scroll down and find a variable that you want to change. So in this case, I'm going to go to the GPS uh, area here. You can see it starts GPS. And I'm going to go to maximum acquisition time. So this is how long it will stay on trying to get GPS fix. So say I'm tracking an object and it's going to go in some super stormy seas in the Southern Ocean. So it's going to be completely um, half the time submerged in, let's say, Antarctica winter time. The wave splash and all of that means I'm probably going to want to spend some more time trying to acquire a fix. So it's continuing to get hit by water. The GPS is going to struggle. So I would set it to maybe spend two minutes trying to get a fix just to cater for that. I may then want to say, actually, because you're going to have to spend a lot of lifetime on the ocean, you're going to be down, down there for many, many months. Maybe only send me a transmission every 500 seconds over satellite. And it's as easy as this to just change some configuration files. You then save the file itself that I just did. You jump out of this and you just write that configuration file back to your device. And these devices come preloaded with configuration files on them. So you don't even have to write them yourself. I can just say write the device like this. Um, and there you go, comes back happy. Um, and then to start it off, to actually get data from this and run it, you disconnect the USB like so. It flashes green a few times and your device is on. You then install that in your bottle, you seal it up with the screws and you chuck it in the sea. And this will then send data back to that Argos dashboard that we saw. So it's a really simple way of you to use IoT effectively. And once you're in this dashboard and you're working in this environment too, you can use this to then share the data with others. So you can do some great storytelling with this. If you're tracking wild dogs or you're tracking any kind of fascinating creature that's out there, data viz is really imperative and getting your data out of dashboards. And it's not just Argos, Iridium have the same uh, fleet and swarm do as well. They've got ni nice dashboards like this, but it wasn't. it's not rocket science. It used to be very difficult to do this. Building a transmitter, a satellite transmitter, into a device and getting data from it used to be complex, but it's become a lot easier to do. So don't be afraid of getting stuck into satellite IoT tech and using it in, in these new ways. Um, and for me, moving forwards as well, if you think about projects that we're all building out there, there's a lot of tech which is off the shelf, which doesn't have connectivity to it. So if you're taking, for example, a Reconyx camera trap or Bushnell camera trap, there's not much you can do to connect that device to a satellite IoT modem and get data from it because it's a closed world. It's restricted to just doing that job. But as we see more and more open source tech coming out, which allows us to talk to devices, so FieldKit and their sensor system, a perfect opportunity there too to connect IoT modems and get data out. That's the kind of world where we can start to do more because we can then take sensor data such as a, from a weather station, and we can decide to stick it on a swarm eva evaluation kit or anything else like that. And I actually do have one of those swarm early swarm evaluation kits here. So this is one I tested with them before they made that new one. Um, and you can see inside, it's a mega mix of off the shelf tech. There's a feather in there, um, Arduino gear. This is their tile modem. And that even the way that they presented this as, an, as a kit is similar to how we would build this. You know, they've tried to use very accessible batteries. Um, they've done it in a way where it's a little basic LCD screen, so you can get stuck in and started and see like your SSID when you connect to Wi-Fi. And if we were to make this, it'd probably look very similar. There's nothing, there's no like, you know, magic going on here beyond what we can't do. You could get these parts off Adafruit or SparkFun and build something, but they've gone ahead and done it. So highly recommend having a look at this as well. And over the next few months and years, 
we're going to see this evolving quite a bit. For so many startups now trying to put constellations up, you're going to see probably a race for different data costs because as competition rises, you'll see probably challenges between how can I, you know, incentivize users to use different systems. So I think we'll see IoT data costs coming down as more constellations go up. You're going to see a lot of new tech in terms of devices you can connect to because how how do you get people onto these stuff like constellation networks? You make dev kits. So it's easy for people to just buy it and connect because the data and the costs are made in airtime. So you're probably going to see a big push for that as well. Um, and as a community, because this is a wildlife talk and you know it's all about the community, um, if we keep sharing what we've done in the forums, the connected kits like the Wildweino board as well, the Argos integration, we'll probably find that we're going to get some really exciting projects from this because we're not just touching satellite IoT and talking satellites, we're playing with tech on the ground. So LoRa networks that, that aggregate all that data into a little box that goes ping and sends it over space super super useful for so many projects and um rob and i rob apple be on the call too we're always talking about this probably daily <laughs> about things we can hack together and connect in that world and i love the idea of what we can do connecting it out to the other world as well so i'll wrap it up there at the 45 minutes in terms of my prez so we've got 15 minutes of talk but hopefully that was a good intro into the world of satellite iot and I think I managed to get a way of doing that all over the Starlink without me dropping off. I don't know. Maybe I dropped off. You tell me. But uh, hopefully I managed to crack that. That was great. Thanks so much, Alistair. Um, this brings us to the Q&A. So just as a reminder, some people have been dropping in questions um, into the chat already. But feel free to keep dropping them in um, as we go along. And we can call on you if you have a mic to ask them yourselves. Um, so first, we've had a lot of both registration questions and um, discussion in the chat around kind of accessibility of these tools. Um, so I wanted to actually ask first a question from David Savage, um, who's here. Uh, and he said, is anyone working on developing an off-the-shelf system for these tools? Um, I'm only too happy to try to figure out stuff like this, but a lot of people in my lab just want something they can kind of grab and go. Um, and so, and we had a lot of registration questions along that line too, like how do my students use this? Where do I get started? So can you speak to that first? Yeah, well, uh, towards the end of my presentation too, you're totally right. That's been the barrier for so long because it used to be a very cl closed world where if you wanted to build your own device, the documentation wasn't really there. Um, and also the hardware wasn't accessible. So you really had to like know low level C coding to get involved. Now we're using Python and JSON and things that are easy to work with. Um, so the tech I shared in the press for students definitely look at the Horizon kit. Um, and it, I'm not like selling it because it's one of something we made. It's like it just is very useful for that. It's uh, designed to be you plug it in, you talk to it over Raspberry Pi, you transmit to satellites. Um, definitely look at the swarm evaluation board and kit. That's pretty good. Um, look at other systems too that aren't actually satellite IoT based as well. So you may have all heard of TinyML, which is really bubbling up to the surface now. That for students as well is going to be super important in the satellite IoT world. Because if you have boards that you're using tiny machine learning on to figure out what the hell it is you need to know. So maybe you're looking for a specific audio noise and you want to filter that audio and only send an alert when you find that exact call of a bird or a frog or something like that. That is, again, 80% of the puzzle. If you can crack that and use very little power and then connect an IoT device to it, you're progressing. So it's not always jump straight to the transmitters and the connectivity. It's solve the problem on the ground and then connect that final piece. So, yeah, I'd recommend getting access to this. Look at the Spark Fun board as well the breakout board, the Arctic R2, that, that has some nice uh, documentation. It's it's all built, again, off the, the open source schematic of this, so it's all shared. Um, and your students will probably find that could be interesting as well. So hopefully that answers, uh, answers that. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, we'll move on to our first participant question. 
Um, I think I'm not sure if Bob has a mic. Bob, are you here? Do you have a mic? Do you want to jump in? How about now? All right. Oh, great, yeah. Alistair. Good, mm -hmm. Bob Zach. Good to see you. Um, it, it, did you work on any bidirectional um, satellite options? Can I? Can you send commands back to the devices? Yeah. Uh, receive hardware. So the receive element on Horizon is built in. So the hardware exists. The software for it, the firmware, is being written this very minute. In fact, it's being worked on this week because CLS, um, the French company behind Argos are adding receive to the same transmitter. So because that's all been built in, we can move forwards with receiving data. And what's really important with receiving data is they use something called prepass. So when the satellites fly over, how does your device know when to transmit to them? Because it has to know when it's going to transmit, otherwise we're wasting so much energy just guessing. And prepass, when you load it on on day one, works perfectly, but due to orbit decay, because there's, there's a slight shift, it, it basically becomes less responsive over time. So not responsive, but it misses the satellites like six to 12 months later. So if you have receive, you can wake this device up, get a new prepass file, and hey, bingo, you're always in perfect sync. So it's really important to have. But um, yeah, to answer that, receive is in the hardware already. The firmware will be released. It'll be open source. And then you basically just flash the device and you have receive and off you go. Does that, uh, does that answer that? All right, thank you. I think that's a great answer. Um, we're going to throw it to Steph next. <laughs> um, just a side comment to Rob and Carly in the chat. You're not helping, um, but um, <laughs> um, Al, that was, was super interesting. I expected, I expected such things. <laughs> <laughs> that was so interesting. Steph, um, Steph yeah. I don't understand what you're. Are you telling me to talk? Yeah, because, because that's a dangerous game to play. No, no, no. It's fine. We'll give you space in a sec. Um, uh, I did actually have a question for you, Al. Um, Thomas, uh, Thomas Gray, who is um, you're kindly filling in for. So thank you so much. Um, has been doing some. Um, he's been doing some kits with horizon tag i was wondering if you could talk about that and tell us what's happening there and what yeah what what's what's happening there and can you just buy a horizon kit and put it on a an animal is is it that quickly off the shelf you you could buy it if it was in stock but oh. luckily lab maker who also sell audio moths they have manufactured 200 devices which is brilliant so they are going to be selling those soon, so you can get access to more stock. And they could only do it because it's open source. That is the beauty of open source. Someone else can go make your thing, and you can just see it be purchased by someone else, and people get access to do projects, which I love, because if it was closed, they couldn't have done it. So LabMaker will have stock soon, the Horizon. But going back to your question about Thomas, yes, what he did is he gave out free kits to anyone who was interested in an environmental project. And Akiva mentioned, I can see loads of great questions there. I can't, I obviously can't answer them all, but Akiva mentioned, do Argos allow um, environmental um, projects? Or, you know, if you were trying to transmit from, uh, let's say, a more destructive industry, like we won't name any, but we can guess, do they allow that? You get with Argos, if you're an environmental project, you get a cheaper rate on the on the fees of what you pay. And they are all, they're focused on environmental um, good. So they're always promoting wildlife tracking and environmental projects. And Thomas gave out those kits because he wanted to know that if he gives out the kits, will people be able to make tags? I.e. I'll incentivize it. I'll say, here's the tag, go and crack the problem. Because no one's done it before at, the, the, at that kind of scale of trying to make a full tag. And the kind of projects running from that, there's a chap making um, a tag for a mega mouth shark. I don't know if you've ever seen a mega mouth shark, but it looks like the kind of probably something out of Alien. It's very, very, very freaky, amazingly weird, interesting species. And um, he he could go and buy an off the shelf solution for like four and a half thousand dollars, right? A, a commercial tag and, and go for it. But the student is taking it on themselves to try and make a tag and de deploy it on those sharks. And he's only doing it for like two weeks. He wants like high resolution behavior data 
and then it'll probably do pop off archival it pops off um so thomas has made those projects happen by giving out free tech arabada supports it with um tech support so questions about configurations and so on but it's very similar to what swarm have done i.e give out evaluation kits they've given out a few you can obviously buy it yourself 500 dollars but that's what they need. This is what these new IoT constellations want. They want users. And what better than giving out some hardware so you use the platform, you get excited about it, and you become a developer on it. So there's a lot of incentive at the minute to say, have hardware, please use our stuff. Um, that's why it's quite exciting to see what's going to happen in that space. I was just going to say, since you mentioned Akiba, is, uh, since you're on the call and you you received one of the kits and a grant from Thomas is that what you've been building what Alistair referenced in his talk uh, uh yeah I've been so uh, I like or just since and I had a meeting with Thomas and then we were discussing the uh like a satellite project a potential satellite project in Australia and then um so Thomas uh, help support us by uh, getting us a kit and also a uh, a horizon uh, a horizon. So sorry, he got us a horizon kit and also some uh, chips uh, for the Argos network. And then after that, and also we have um, like the grant is actually not in money, but in uh, service and data time for on the Argos network. But it's also mm -hmm. I mean there's. There's a lot of support that's required in order to design hardware for Argos because you also need to go through the certification process. And then um, so yeah. you would need to like so any kind of project that you have that goes on the Argos network, you'd have to clear it with either Thomas or someone from Argos. Yeah, you have to send your actual board off to, to be certified and they'll check that it's suitable. So it's, it's actually got like the right RF output. You no, know, it's it's not going to damage the network. Um, and then it gets certified, and if it's certified, you can then make it and do something with it. So can I ask, so it sounds like like you're kind of at the first step of like getting Horizon Tech out there. What are the next couple of steps? Talia, I will give it back to you in a second. I'm getting I'm getting caught up. Well, <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm, I, I picked one network because it's, it's prime for my target. Like Arabada is, it's heart with sea turtle conservation. It, you know, Arabada means arrival, so it's about arrival of open source tech at scale. Like, and Arabada is arrival of all of Ridley's all nesting together, right? So, the future of this is how do you get people on your side working with the hardware and in a way which works well, and that comes down to documentation, support, mm. all the things that I'm actually really only just getting into. Like, we have like a basic GitHub, we have a a startup guy, but it's like 10% of what it could be. But it takes some time to get the hardware done and make sure it works and it's accessible and it's 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 in bottles floating around in the ocean and it's it's doing its job. Then you want to build up that kind of DevOps world, world and get people supported. So you'll see forums coming up on our side soon, just like Audiomoff, right? They have a good forum. You can go and ask questions. But um, also, it's not user it's not just user focused and audio off is I plug it in as a config and off I go right T making tags is a lot more involved you know it's uh, it's it's understanding how to work with epoxy encapsulation resins and how to get them to work well it's how to you know work with multiple sensors so it's a lot it's a bit more dev focused and that is something that I hope we get more traction in but I mean, even today to have this call, you wouldn't be doing this years ago. Just there was nothing to talk about. It was like I bought a tag yeah. from two or three small companies and that's it. What can you do with it? Well, I can basically turn it on with my magnetic switch and it does whatever the tag does. You couldn't hack anything. It was like there was no decent boards. So there, was, there was the rock block, which kind of did that for Iridium, which is the first one out. But then again, that's very limited because it's great for, for any object that you want to track like a you know, a fixed asset on a pole somewhere. But if you want to put it on a tiny animal, it's just a bit too big. So it, we're getting there now. There's a bit more of a, an IoT world. And this race to space has helped as well. So many kind of IoT startups who want you to, to get involved. So I think it's going to be exciting to see what happens next. And even in chat, you can see there are people playing with tiny ML and these new sensors. And how do you make it go ping from the top of a mountain? Well, nothing better than a an IoT nanosat constellation.
All right, Steph, any more follow ups before we move on? Look, oh, I mean, yeah. I, I will. I, but no, go. You've got a good next question. We just had one from registration that seemed um, relevant Al, about open source. Um, I don't think this person's here today, but they said, how much of the tech stack you're, ta are you you're talking about today is fully open source and how can we make more of it open source? And I know you touched on that a little bit in your talk, but can you speak to that more? Yeah, so fully open source is a really good point because what you can sometimes see is the hardware may be open, but the firmware isn't, which can be difficult. Or you get open source hardware and firmware, but you can't do anything with it because no one shared the actual step files for the CAD to actually put this in a device. So full stack in IoT making devices is really important to try and remove those barriers. And if you don't give someone that 10% at the end, like how do you actually get the right battery chemistry for this thing, then you're still limited. Doesn't matter how good your, your firmware modification is, if the device doesn't have enough power. So Horizon is full stack. So it's completely open source hardware, firmware and CAD files for the enclosures we use. So you can just, with the right support, take that and make your own stuff. Um, the Spark Fun board is as well. Um, I mentioned, I, I spotted here actually that Nigel Butcher put a, uh, put a question in too about Icarus, which I didn't mention. Which is a which is an exciting one for for bird tracking. Um, Icarus and open source is interesting. I think I don't think it's full stack, which was always frust a frustration for me. I don't think you had full access to the electronics and the actual firmware and the enclosure design. If it if anyone knows if it is, tell me because I'd have to look. Yeah, no, it isn't. Uh, so Icarus isn't. So that is a shame because I think they should have open sourced it because. What Nigel's saying too here is they use the ISS at so the space station as their gateway. And they've been trying so hard for so long to get that up and running. And it's challenging because the ISS is getting old. So there's talk about in, by 2030, it will have to be decommissioned because there are cracks and strange things happening. And this is a problem too with any kind of startup, I think, in that if you get your constellation up in space and bad things happen on planet Earth, like you can't run it, what happens, right? And at the minute, there's a lot of constellations going up there who, who all have VC funding and are getting excited about this. If you have a lot of them, which ones are going to really, you know, survive and do well is a question I can't answer today. But um, openness, again, is good because if you open source the tech and there's ability to change hardware and move around and try different constellations and then work with different providers, we won't all get stuck, we won't get bricked in the future. We'll be able to move together and make sure our projects, which in wildlife conservation is paramount, don't end up with big funding and then something goes down and you can't get your data. So keep it open is my incentive there. And any any developers or companies that may watch this presentation that are, in, that are on the fence thinking about it, in conservation it's paramount because we really need to make sure that we can we can do that. All right, yeah. Um, I think we have a question from Excellence. Uh, do you have a microphone or should I read this out for you? Okay, oh, I'll read it out. Um, so Excellence said, excellent talk. Um, I really like the aspect of tracking plastics with IoT devices. How can I get a quality device to use for my experiment? OK, um, is it, there's no mic, right? So we, we we can't talk straight through. I don't think so. We're hoping, yeah. Maybe Excellence can explain more in the chat if you hear us. Yeah, ping, ping in the chat what it is you want to actually track. It sounded like they're looking at how can you how can you get and you know start your own project, right? Yeah, sounded so, like that, yeah. If you're interested in doing this and you want to do, you, you know, you've got your own bespoke item, let's say you want to track um, a medical container, something like that, right? Like a little kind of you know, tube or something like this. If I was starting today thinking about a project like that, the first thing you do before you even get the hardware is think about the scale you want to achieve. 
So how many devices are you going to track is, is imperative because once you say, oh, I want to track 100, you really got to think about how the airtime and the cost of tracking 100 is going to impact your project. So you figure out all the basics first, then get into the mechanics of it, because what you'll find is on your desk, things can work and you're really happy about that because, you know, you, you take in your garden, it goes ping from the top of your shed, you bring it back in, you think, great, I've cracked it, I'll just make 100 more of these devices. The real world destroys things. <laughs> So if your device ends up in the wrong kind of weather, the battery chemistry gets affected by the cold, animals like eating things. If it's on the ocean, you've got that continuous issue of water ingress. So are you going to encapsulate it? Are you going to get any kind of like issues such as um, splashed over the antenna so you can't transmit? Just, yeah, there you go. One of his boom boxes got charged by an elephant at Kiba's. When when you take IoT tech, especially wildlife, into the big, scary, real world, bad things happen. And even those bottles floating on the ocean, they went through two huge storms. And I'm sitting there, you know, watching the data come in, thinking, cross fingers, is, is it going to ping in the morning? Always worried about it. And when you see the ping come in, you're like, holy mackerel, it's great. And you see these photos on BBC News of these, like, 20 foot waves crashing in and it's all climate change talk and it's scary stuff. And you, you look at the, the footage of the ocean, you think, how the hell is my little bottle surviving out there? But you build it with the best of your knowledge. Prepare as well for the first time you do it, it ain't going to go to plan. I've had projects that I've done where I've, you know, done everything right in my head. You deploy it and you suddenly realize that something you did didn't work. Um, and you have to go back, learn from that, fix it, understand what broke it and do it again. You won't crack it first time, but you will get there, um, especially in this world. It takes time. Don't expect to crack it on day one, but you'll get there. So I, I don't know if that was useful, but summary, look at the mechanics of it. Check the data and cost. Don't deploy and then realize you can't afford to pay for it a year later when you've got a great item that you, know, you want to track and then get involved in building and buying the hardware. All excellent advice, I think, helpful for all of us, even if it wasn't exactly what Excellence was talking about. Um, the next question is from Duncan, and I believe you have a mic. Duncan, do you want to jump in? Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, hi, also, that, that's, that's a fantastic talk. Thanks so much. It's, it's amazing how much this technology has come on in the last five, ten years. Um, the question that I had is it's, it's kind of based upon my experience of it sort of 10 years ago. So I'm based in the UK um, and do typically doing urban, but also increasingly kind of rural monitoring using IoT. And I guess I'd probably always discounted satellite in the UK because the UK is, is actually quite small in the sense mm. of it feels like you can put out um, lower one networks or something. It feels like you can put out ground based networks. Um, but you've got me thinking maybe I should be looking at that differently now. So would you say that there are applications of satellite radios within somewhere like the UK, a small place like the UK? Yeah, it, it is funny when you say the UK, you look at the, the actual footprint of a satellite, it, it, it'll pass over the entire UK in a minute and a half. It, it's, it's crazy. Um, I would say the exciting space is to look at the, the hybrids. So actually, Lacuna Space is a UK startup. So they've been working with the UK um, Satellite um, Space Agency um, to look at that ubiquitous solution of how do you get a LoRaWAN device to talk to a satellite, but also how do you work with, like you said, a terrestrial network? So in the UK, it'd be quite useful to have, let's say, more hubs or spokes where you can get data out in the highlands of Scotland, somewhere like that, or on a coastal strip where cellular just isn't available because it even though it is everywhere as we say only really that is still cities and really only if you really need data right 4g or, or 3g but if you're in uh, a remote location in the uk or actually if you just want to get your data out from a location that isn't actually served by any decent providers so let's say you've got a, a basic 3g connection but it's just too um sporadic and you, you're getting you know disconnects with a satellite you may want to fall back and say well this box is going to go ping i've got perfect clear line of sight to the sky i'll use this to get around that um but i think that i wouldn't probably go for every single transmitter has a, a sat uh, modem in in the uk i'd go for those hubs and spokes so 
Laura Wan to a hub. Um, and Lacuna Space are quite exciting what they're doing because they're obviously playing with Laura Tech and they're playing with that other element. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Is that, is that useful? Yeah, no, it is. Cause, cause I, think it, I, I think it's when it gets to that kind of price point comparative as well that makes it that makes it as as economical to do it as well. So I think it's the price thing is the other factor. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. Yeah, price is price is critical, as you said. Like a hundred devices freely talking to a LoRaWAN gateway with one hub, that gateway could figure out data that you want to send from the devices, filter it, use some tiny ML, and send it back over SAT which is massively more cost effective. So I hope we see that soon in conservation tech too, these, these nice kind of um, Laura One hybrid satellite hubs coming out like the like Akiva's one. Thanks. Uh, Ellie, do you want to try your question? Yes, okay. I will leave my video off in case my internet still isn't that great but uh hopefully everybody can hear me hey al uh, that was a really great talk um i have a couple questions about the penguin cameras in antarctica that i was uh, hoping to ask earlier before my <laughs> my internet was destroyed um so i'm really interested in how that has revolutionized you know being able to research these issues in these really really remote areas that people used to have to essentially risk their lives to get to just to see the penguin populations. And now they can be monitored year round, which is, you know, incredible. That couldn't even have been imagined like 50 years ago. So I'm wondering what you think the next phase of that would be, you know, how much you think this technology could progress? Is, is it kind of like plateaued right now? And it's like, as far as it's possibly going to go, or could there be some other evolution in the future that would like let you get live streaming video or even just any video clips at all versus just like pictures every few minutes? Yeah, well, that's why I tried to do this whole presentation on the Starlink dish, right? It's not just Starlink, it's OneWeb as well. We're already, we're already doing it right now, this very second. The fact that I can stream video from a dish that is, sitting in my garden even though well vsat as it's called satellite internet has been around for a long time but it's never been this good i couldn't stream video and sit on a call like this for an hour and have anything like the clarity or the quality of this so if you want if you want to talk about data from antarctica it's we're starting to get into that space where you can put a solar panel up to power a bigger dish and you can get really fast net and when i mean fast it's like 20, 20 megabytes a second down, two megabytes up from Antarctica was just unheard of years ago. And I've traveled around Africa in trucks, setting up VSAT dishes, and you can barely email somebody, let alone anything else. So it's starting to get into that position now where we can send big amounts of data. But I'll show you, I'll show you a photo from one of those cameras in Antarctica. I'll just share my screen again now. Um, I'll share you, this is a little sync actually. This is a very scary photo, but I'll explain in a minute. So this was a time-lapse camera that was left in Antarctica in 2018. You can see there's a photo there on the left on the 7th of February, 2018. That was the first photo that this time-lapse camera took. And that's a photo of my face installing the thing on Paulette, which is a volcano in Antarctica that the penguins use. It's where they, they have their rookery. These are Delhi penguins. I've mean, installed this camera down there in 2018 before we had access to, this is the first version cam, before we embedded any IoT sensors in there. So this is before we made Horizon, before we had Lacuna, before we had all of that. We now have cameras out there that have Horizon and Lacuna modems in them so we can get data back. But because we couldn't get a ping from this song, because it was, it was back in the day, we left it out there for a year. And we wanted to get it back in 2019 and get the data off it to the save photo as the SD card. But the boat couldn't get back due to sea ice because this sea in the background here completely freezes over in the winter. And this, this camera took a photo every hour. So it's taking a photo every hour and going back to sleep. So 2019, we missed it. We couldn't get back to the camera. This is an actual photo the next year, that date. 2020 rocks up, the pandemic hits. So all the boats are cancelled, coronavirus takes over the world, couldn't get back to the camera. 2001 rocks up, we're still waiting to get there, 
And three and a half years later, after we turned this camera on, we finally managed to physically get it back. We took it back home, had that very nerve wracking moment to pop the SD card out and see what was on it. And it was spinning for like, for what seemed like forever. And I thought oh, it's gonna come back as a corrupt card. It's been in, it's been through three Antarctic winters. It's a Raspberry Pi Zero in the camera. So it's like a $15, 10 pound piece of hardware inside on a little time-lapse um, RTC we made to wake it up. And it only just, it kept working for three and a half years and we got 27,000 photos off this thing. And we never knew because we didn't have access to IoT and satellites that A, had it stopped a week later, had it failed a day later, had it failed an hour later, we didn't know, we just crossed our fingers. If we, if we put cameras out today, we'd get a ping saying everything's okay or it's not. When you're next down, come and change me, fix me, I've broken. That's so valid when it costs a fortune in both time, effort, and it's so difficult to get. You really want to know if it's worth going to a remote volcano in Antarctica and getting your camera switched out. So we can do that now. But what's really scary about this photo is on the 7th of February 2020, in this one here, the UN noted that it was the hottest day ever recorded in Antarctica since records began. And we got this camera back in 2021, a few months ago. And this news broke about a month ago, but the hottest day ever recorded, it was 18 degrees C at a research base called Esperanza, but it was only about, I think it's like 50 miles away from where this camera was. And our camera on that day recorded 16.25 degrees C, which is absolutely ridiculous considering this is Antarctica. If you have a look in this photo here, it's a hot, sunny day. 16 degrees is way too hot for our planet. In 2019, it was four degrees on the same day. And it's probably similar here. Um, and we didn't know this. We had to get the camera back to figure it out. But if we had a little IoT satellite in there, we could have A, ping the data. And if we'd had an even bigger dish, where, you know, some good bandwidth, which OneWeb's coming out with now and Starlink and everyone else, we could send back the photos and we could say, OK, this is important because you don't know a day later this camera is not going to fail, that the SD card is going to corrupt, that it's going to break. And this is super inf important information. We have a photo here and of course we took a photo every hour so we can go back in time and see how are these penguins surviving. Um, you can see what the penguins actually did to dissipate heat. They, they kind of lift their um, wings up. And you can start to see in the photo how it's affecting them. Like, are they changing their behavior due to the heat? Are chicks suffering? All these questions, like this is a chick down here, all these questions come out in the wash once you've got the data back. But getting the data back is paramount. So can we use IoT sats to say, hey, data's worth uploading? And can we use bigger dishes to then say, well, send me a few gigabytes um, through space? So really, Really interesting insights into some of the projects there. And I wish we'd had some of the modems we've built now on that camera so we could have we could have realized back in the day. But luckily we got it back. So we may not have been able to. Thank you, Al. That was Thanks, so Al. interesting. And oh sorry, sorry, Talia. I think I'm still a little delayed. Um thank you so much. Right. And um we're gonna get you to do a whole a whole article on these penguin cameras at some point because I find them so fascinating and especially the the climate change aspect of it like yeah. the fact that you're getting that data essentially in not in real time but that you can watch it change in such detail over such a long amount of time is incredible and very scary also yeah it really is and uh, the more we can we can you know do in that space the better so happy to do that. We'll, we'll, we'll go into a deep dive of like how that camera was built. It's all open source again. So um, if you want to recreate it, you can. Awesome. All right. Um, I know we're over time. We have asked Al permission to stay long. Um, and I just wanted to flag for those who have to jump off. Um, you can register for our next event uh, next week on participatory mapping. And we'll drop in a link to that. Um, we're allowing Rob one question before we wrap up. So Rob, you can jump in. Just one. Um, <laughs> I I just wanted to, I think that story, like I, I saw Shah comment that that's an amazing story. 
I think it's an amazing story for many reasons. One of the things that really struck me, though, was I think you said it had over 20,000 plus images. Is that right? Yeah, so 27,000. Can you, can you put into perspective how much those data are worth given all the battles you had to get to to get to Antarctica, oh, yeah. the cost of going versus something like a satellite link? Because I think this is where that balance becomes really important in the discussion. Like what would the cost difference be, do you think? Just off the top. <laughs> Absolutely insane. If you, I mean, I go through Penguin Watch is the project that runs it. So it's Tom Hart's project. When he does his kind of um, select trips to very, very remote locations in Antarctica and he has to charter uh, a yacht or, or and when, he, when he's not charging it for himself, he's like with like you know, eight people on this yacht. You're talking like 12,000 pounds a day to get some some of that down there for serious trips where you, you go away for a week, you come back and it is a serious budget. Like the cost of boat time and getting down is astronomical. Um, the only way we managed to do this is we use ships of opportunity. So the tourist vessels that go down, because you can pay to go to Antarctica. Um, you can go on some really amazing, um, like, tour-led trips for two weeks down to the Circle and back to South Georgia. But it's going to cost you about £12,000 for a berth. It's very yeah. expensive, but it's life-changing stuff. The reason we get down there is we get a free berth on that vessel. And whilst the tourists go off and do their thing, we get the free trip. We use that to get on a little Zodiac. We drive drive out to these penguin rookeries and we put cameras up. And then you're lucky if the boat goes back a year later and you get to jump off and get that camera and grab the data quickly. Now, in this case, this camera didn't get didn't get picked up for three and a half years. So how do you scale? What if you have 200, 300 cameras? Imagine yeah. trying to get around to get all those cameras and the sheer cost. It's It's probably... We'll have to add it up, Rob, and have a look at it, but it'd be absolutely ridiculous. The costs compared to flying through space through a satellite compared to physically touching and getting those cameras back, it would be absolutely insane to add that up. Yeah. Just yeah. thought that would, I mean, for me as well, and for a lot of the people I speak to, that that kind of perspective, I think, gives a, because often people, and you know this yourself, people will say oh well i can't afford that tech you know like i'll buy an old school vhf transmitter and then you try and explain to them well how often are you going to go out you know even if you've got a hundred really good locations with your vhf over the course of you know a year how much does that actually cost you in time and i think this yeah. sort of becomes exponential as you start talking about remote places the quality of the information that you're capturing you know, you, you built that camera for, you know, almost nothing in comparison to how much it costs to actually get there. Um, so it seems to me that it's more and more becoming about the hardware is quite cheap, you know, and I think there's a lot of collaborators on Wild Labs, for example, that together could build some awesome equipment. And... Yeah, I just find it really fascinating that, I mean, I still know people who would talk about satellite fees as being exorbitant, um, but the, I think yeah. that your story really put it into perspective. But I don't want to hold, yeah. you can talk about this later. But no, yeah, it's, I just, it, it, I mean, it's starting to change now. Like the, the feed I'm on now, which we did this whole talk through, is expensive if you're, you don't, it's 90 pounds a month, but you could have one, hub at 90 pounds a month which which has the ability to download at 20 megaseconds 20 megabytes like 200 megabit or upload at uh two megabytes and look, two megabytes up from a box in antarctica is unbelievably good so think about like a, a, a long-range network well you could you could use you could use traditional like long-range wi-fi from cameras to this one box and have like 50 on a peninsula or going up through this box and you get and you don't get like a little little thumbnail back. Um, you get like serious, good quality, high res data. So and if Edge, if you factored in Edge with that, where Edge did some of the processing before the data got sent. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So that you're getting only the most valuable stuff to you. You know, again, yeah. So I really I like this cost benefits kind of idea. 
we should look at that, I think. I'm sure yeah. maybe Akiba or Shah or some other people on here have, have looked on at that. I, I think we're already all doing it as well, right? You've got field yeah. kit, which would benefit massively yeah. from like multiple field kits connected. You've got Akiba who's already working on Laura Wan to Argos for just, you know, hub. It's it's happening. We just need to get more of it out now and say, here are some real field solutions. And like Robin's saying there too, you still want to get out there. You want to be in the field doing it to learn how it works. Well, you, you still just have want to, put to know the kit that out. your gear is working. Yeah. You still have to put it out at some point and still collect it at some point. But I just think of that story of like, imagine what it would have taken for you to go and collect 21,000 images with no view of ever having satellite as a comparison, you know, like $12,000 a birth. I mean, you can't even. Yeah, to one location, right? It's like, how do you get to multiple locations? It's like, you can't do it. Yeah. Okay, I know you two could talk for hours about this, so I jump in. Thank you for your questions, Rob. Um, Al, I know you had to go after 15 minutes. Do you have time for a follow-up or you need to jump off? Either way is totally fine. I can do one, I can do five more minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, you already addressed a lot of our kind of big picture questions that we normally ask. Carly, you missed your chance, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I said, come to me last. It's last. Well, Okay, well, can, can you do it? Can you ask a question in two minutes? It has to be big picture so Al can give it like a nice rounded yes. ending. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, it's a okay. big picture. Okay. <laughs> okay. So for Starling, for all ahead. the conservationists who uh, did not know what Starlink was when you said you were streaming it over Starlink and so we didn't even know what that meant or what a big deal that was and are throwing out all of these different options with pros and cons, but have like not really a clue how we compare them ourselves Mm -hmm. who just want to grab and go something like David was saying, how, like, what are we, what are we supposed to do? Like, I, okay. I have 30 audio moss. I want to go put them out in Madagascar. You just said you have to get like a dev board to do it. So do I like, what do I do with my 30 audio moss? that I want to go put out in the Madagascar rainforest? Like what is- Very, step- very good question. Yeah, even when I was doing that presentation, I thought, how would you cover in that space of time all of those problems? Now, the answer is there isn't a solution off the shelf at the minute, which is like USB. I plug it in, I press send it over here, and it pings on your phone on WhatsApp, right? So you can take a normal audio off. It still has breakouts and, and so on, but you're gonna need a bit more engineering um, let's say expertise to do that, right? Whereas the dev board solves a few of those problems for you. So it's easy to do. So even then though, if you went and bought a dev board off the shelf, you're still gonna want to get some some support if you're not actually in that space yourself, if you're not a software developer or hardware engineer to then connect those two devices together, right? But that isn't rocket science again, if it's done well with good documentation. We could, together as a community, take a rock block or horizon or any evaluation kit and do a guide, stick it on Wild Labs. Steph would love it because it's on Wild Labs. And we could say, here's how you take an audio off and you make it go ping. The audio off team would love to do it. They're already playing with that tech. They've got an evaluation kit themselves. So it's probably just a matter of time before we come up with some guides saying, here's how you do it. Download this version of firmware solder this device on or get a dev kit or a dev board if not do it this way and we can do it so let's do that i'll end it i'll wrap it up there that we should make guys together how to guys no no my 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 thing was when are we making these guys when are they going to be available like walking us through these sort of things well we could do it for carl carly we could we could say hey carly you want to try it let's do a guide We'll get the team together. We'll get who's involved and say, let's make Carly's audio off. Send a message. I'm literally waiting in purgatory until Madagascar lets me in. I have quite literally nothing better, like else or better to do. Well, I'm sure could, we could make it happen. It's been 10 minutes. That's my I kid saying this. I'm over time. I'm person to test your guides against. Ask Akiba and Jacinta, who literally came up with the what would Carly think mantra when they made their data logger course. <laughs> yeah. 
That's true. Okay, well, that was a lovely next steps thing to add to end on. Um, I guess, like in the last minute, is there anything else you want to share that we maybe should have asked you that we didn't, um, or things about what makes you optimistic about the future? To me. Mhm. Mm yeah, I think I'm optimistic because we're at a very exciting junction in IoT satellite tech. We've got people in chat who are making their own boards which we never used to see. We've got enough people in the wildlife community to answer a problem that someone says, like Carly saying, hey, I want to make it go ping, but I don't know how. We can do the guides. Just have to get the team together and say, here's how you do it. And this never used to happen. So I'm very optimistic that we're actually working with satellite IoT in a very different way compared to years ago when I started in this world. And it was very, very hard to do this. So. Let's keep doing that and we'll see where we get uh, as we as we move together. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone. Okay. For thanks everyone.